टू वन सर वी आर लाइव नाउ नाउ वी कैन स्टार्ट गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन मैं सर डॉक्टर चिन्मय आई एम अ कंसल्टेंट पीडियाटिक ऑर्थोपेडिक सर्जन करंटली प्रैक्टिसिंग इन अमरावती इन स्टेट ऑफ महाराष्ट्र सो इन टूडेज फेलो टीचिंग मॉड्यूल Uh, in day to day pediatric orthopedic cases module uh, we are discussing about two uh, two scenarios that is flexible flat feet and torsional mal alignment so we have two uh, eminent faculty to give us a like, uh, to give us a insight in these two topics first we have dr tushar agrawal who is a visiting professor in mgm navi mumbai sir uh, sir done uh, sir did his fellowship from shinner's hospital salt lake city in usa at the same time sir is uh, under uh, under the guidance of dr ashok jhari completed his fellowship in pediatric orthopedics sir is having special interest in deformity correction and as well as the cerebral palsy sir have a numerous publication in, by his names and sir is keen in interested to teach uh, new techniques and uh, new uh, clinical examinations points to the, all his fellows and the second uh, faculty is dr vidya sagar he is a consultant in hyderabad sir did his sir did his fellowship from cmc vello and uh, in kent children hospital hong kong sir have a special interest in trauma cluster and infection sir have a numerous publication in uh, femoral neck fractures and uh, uh, and sir give uh, and sir is also uh, very much interested in infection and trauma as well so over to you no over to you tushar sir you can start sharing your screen thank you good morning everybody uh, i hope i am audible yes sir yeah yeah and thank you so much for the kind introduction and again thank you very much uh, molly is it has it come it's always so confusing just a second <laughs> i think it's already there sir if you click yeah, yeah, on yeah, yeah. the see it is there now where has it gone okay okay are we good yeah yeah, yeah. okay so uh, <clears throat> i think molin has a very good idea of whom to select for what kind of topic right so he uh, is very careful not to give me hip preservation because he knows who the dons of pediatric orthopedics are and who are the milder pediatric orthopedic surgeons okay so i am a milder pediatric orthopedic surgeon and uh, chinmay you can keep talking in between to make me feel yeah. that uh, every everything is online okay sure sure sir sure, sure, sure. yeah. okay so uh, now let's take this first case i'm sure you can all see this is what you will see today when you start your opd yes sir so regularly Like a three, three and half year old child, and parents are concerned. You can see the parents standing behind, you know, and you can see the feet twisting a little bit inside, and mm -hmm. you've already made up your mind of what you are going to be doing. And almost, uh, you know, just to please the parents, you sort of examine the patient. Okay, and you examine the patient in. You have already seen the patient. You've taken the history. and uh, now you are examining the patient in supine position you have examined the feet ankle uh, you are examining the knees then you take the patient prone and you are seeing the thigh foot index the hip rotations the amount of external rotation stretch you can give and you have drawn your conclusion as to what it is right so it's yes, a sir. It's a no gamer right everybody knows in the planet what it is right so there is nothing more to it now you get another patient like this regular slightly younger child how old is ajao or ajao or age ka a bit turn and again you see the parents anxious behind and the the reason i have shown you is they may not always into you know see sometimes they into more in the more in front of the parents and it's very difficult to capture their video when they are younger right they are not very obedient and then you take a still like this and where do you focus you focus on the patella so that's going to show you where the pathology lies you focus on the leg part and you focus on the feet and the toes now you have already drawn your conclusion right and you know most of the time why are we pediatric orthopedic surgeons because we want to do something contribute something actively manage something and in the, most of the time these pathologies we don't have so much to offer now we have a 16 year old chalai na chalai and she is a syndromic child 
with some motor sensory deficits, autism, and the parents feel that uh, of late she has started working in into it. So Chime, we are here together on that. So we yes, need yes. some types of uh, intoing, some which are apparent, some which are subtle, and some which are older and not very apparent, but very much bothering the parents. Now, I think ever since, uh, like Chime mentioned that, you know, I studied with Dr. Johari, I was with him for six years. So at that time, we didn't have these online resources available to us to learn. But we had this Tahili's book, you know, a thin book and a slightly thicker book he had on pediatric orthopedics. Uh, I, I would love it if everybody gives a show of hands that they are familiar with the book and they have read the book. And they, and it, I think he mentions this torsional profile in its biggest glory, you know. And these images are standing out from the book all the time. You would agree, Chinmay, that they, these yes, images yes, always stand out, right? Mm -hmm. So, Whenever we see a child with intoing, there are a couple of things which we have to think. Why has this parent come to me? Is there something else which is wrong with this patient? Okay. And then you ask a detailed history. And the detailed history would be a developmental history. Okay. History of motor milestones, as we shall see later in the presentations, in this presentation. And anything else which is odd about the patients. If nothing else is odd about the patient, you also focus on the body mass index of the patient. Is the child obese? Is there something else happening with the patient? So if nothing else comes to your mind, then you go and see the child walk. You see the food progression index. You examine the patient in supine and prone. You see the thigh foot angle. You see for the hip rotations and you see for the foot shape. Okay. And that's how you decide which of the three major areas of the anatomy is involved in causing this torsion. So that is what Stahili meant by the torsional profile. So is it happening from the foot? Is it happening from the tibia? Or is it happening from the hip? So initially I thought I'll just show some videos. But as I was doing my uh, research for this talk, I came across this very interesting article by Lee and Leong in a Hong Kong journal, you know, and I took some, borrowed some theory slides from them, from that their text. So why is it so important to see these patients? If we are not making any contribution, if we are not going to actively do anything as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, why do we see them? So it is because first of all, it's one of the most common condition we will encounter in our practice. Okay. And it's very important that very early in the life of the kid, we should find out whether there is any neuromuscular challenge or any developmental pathology happening in this patient. Predominantly a cerebral palsy or a DDH. Means is it something subtle that others could be missing or we should not miss. Now a very important concept. So anything, so the bone has a natural twist to itself, right? You would agree a femur and tibia has some natural twist to itself. All will agree? Yes, sir. Yeah, great. Superb. So now when the twist is in normal direction and in normal magnitude, we call it version. And only when it is in abnormal direction and in abnormal magnitude, do we call it torsion. So you got my point? So yes, when sir, that's it is nice normal direction and normal magnitude, what will we call it? We'll call it a version or a rotation. Only the torsion word is to be used only when it is in the wrong direction. That means uh, there is too much of antiversion or there is retroversion. So then it is a retro torsion or an anti torsion. Or there is more than 15 degrees of external rotation in the tibia. So it is a extortion. So I think, or if there is any internal rotation in the tibia beyond zero degrees, then it is a intorsion. So it has to be in the wrong direction and in the wrong magnitude, right? And then there is a pattern in which how you calculate the rotation. So it is done between the proximal metaphyseal end and the distal metaphyseal end of the bone. So for the femur, it will be through a line which is drawn from the trochanter into the head. 
of the femur. So in, through the neck into the head, that's the proximal line. And the distal line will be through the epicondylar axis. And for the tibia, it will be through the transcondylar axis and through the transmalleolar axis. Okay, so it is a pathology which is as common as the next stalk, flat foot, bow leg and knock knees. And it falls into a special category which is called as a physiological problems. So what do we have? We have congenital problems. We have physiological problems. We have developmental problems and so many <laughs> others in kids, right? So this is a special category. It's called physiological problem. So, so these two terminologies, I actually became familiar during preparing my talk. So I hope all of you all gather. So this is a new category. It's a physiological problem. And number two we learned is that only when it is in the wrong direction and wrong magnitude, will we call it a torsion, right? Now, the third important concept is it's always, if it's physiological, it's always because of these three reasons. Excessive femoral antiversion, internal tibial torsion and metatarsus adductus. It can be because of one, two or all the three. And our management of this condition will be based upon understanding the causes, the natural course of the condition and the effectiveness of various treatment modalities. Okay. And because we have a poor understanding of this condition and we are so compelled to treat these patients, we over treat them with braces or special footwear. You agree that, you know, the parents can compel us, you know, and then we feel that, okay, chalo ye brace lagayenge, ye brace lagayenge. so that's not really right. So when the child is very small, so here the word is infant. So just about walking age. So the first most common cause should be the metatarsus adductus, right? When the child is a toddler, above a toddler, like in the third year of life, just completing second year of life or in the late second year, it will be because of internal tibial torsion. And when the child is after the three years of age, so around three and a half, four, four and a half, then either it is a combination of all three or it is the manifestation of femoral antiversion. Now I'll explain. Uh, Chinmay, you are here with me. So I'll explain. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So what I'm trying to explain is that embryologically, the limb is in external rotation in spite of the femoral antiversion when a newborn is born. And this external rotation attitude of the limb persists till three years of age. Right? So as a result of which the antiversion of the femur will manifest in a walking child only after three years of age. So even though you have excessive femoral antiversion seen in the prone position, the manifestation of this femoral antiversion comes only when the child is three and a half, four years of age. I hope everybody has got this point. Okay. So in the first year, it is metatarsus adductus, second year tibial intorsion, and only after the third year in the walking child, will it be because of the femoral antiversion. Though the femoral antiversion could have been present and I was always present in the younger child. And at every point, you are supposed to identify whether this patient has cerebral palsy or hip dysplasia. And hip in towing is a frequent cause of anxiety in parents. So it is important to understand that what is really uh, causing these parents to come to us and why they want us to be, uh, this child to be taken seriously. And are they worried about the present problem or they are worried that this problem is going to persist and cause some long-term disability okay, and cause some arthritis or difficult for the child to participate in sports. And you may want to ask for family history of rotational problems, take detailed developmental history and ask about the nature of the disability such as tripping or falling. Right? And Look for W sitting, look for patella inwards. So patella inwards means it's coming from the part above, right? It's coming from the femur and the patella looking straight and the legs looking inwards is from tibial intorsion. Verify it with the femoral rotations and by measuring the thigh foot axis accurately. Now, an important point is that if the foot is deformed and if you want to me measure the thigh foot axis, 
you measure the transmellular axis like this in this image and then draw a perpendicular line okay to the transmellular axis and measure from the femur so either you can draw with a perpendicular line to the transmellular axis in a deformed foot or you can measure the thigh foot axis for tibial intortion and this is just a comparative image this child had come to me for you know presumed genuvarus but you see how wonderful the tibial torsions are so yes, embryologically sir. the child is always born with neutral rotation or very very mild intortion which will go into external rotation right so tibial intortion should correct very rapidly in the newborn child so we'll just summarize so in intoing the foot is the most important point for metatarsus adductus you have to take the heel bisector line that's a separate topic if you want to treat metatarsus adductus okay how do you want to classify metatarsus adductus and you may want to cast them if it persists beyond one and a half years or just about one and a half years in tibial intortion you rarely will do any osteotomy and in femoral antiversion you know if the antiversion persists for slightly more than 8 i would keep it at 10 11 and if we can actually uh, you know get these uh, thigh foot axis i'll just show you if you get a ct scan and if you can get a thigh foot a uh, 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 a ct scan torsional profile which shows you significant rotation you may counsel the parents for an osteotomy now a few misconception will shoes correct no will night splints correct no and there are braces will it correct calipers will it correct so no there are enough articles to support that nothing corrects physiological intoing in fact there is a rabbit model study which shows that forceful correction will actually damage the growth cartilage and the articular cartilage of the ankle joint so we should never do forcible splinting of physiological intoing right and we should understand the natural history of this intoing and thereby explain it well to the patient so these are images to show that nothing works you know no form of a non surgical treatment forceful bracing does not work okay and for the purpose of femur you can do a derotation osteotomy distal or proximal i have done derotation osteotomy mainly for cerebral palsy patients and my current choice is a you know a proximal femur osteotomy and i use a philos plate for stabilization few points uh, dr benjamin uh, joseph's book gives this very distinct distinctly the cover test most of these patients would actually come to you with bowed legs and wobbly where you actually discover the uh, tibial intortion and the distal femoral varus will be further adding to the uh, yeah. whole physiological gait abnormal gait pattern you know so the child is like this huge obese child and he is walking with bowed legs with huge tibial intortion so if you cover the distal two third of the legs you decide the clinically the thigh and the upper tibia are in straight line so the patient is not having significant physiological uh, tibial vara and i like to examine the patient in prone position like this so if the patient can comfortably come in external rotation like this this is a good sign for a physiological bowed leg i always examine them if possible sitting cross legged asking them to squat and more and more children are finding it difficult to squat independently i am sure most of my colleagues will agree see this is an example of good positive thigh foot axis right and rotations which will be normal and i also examine i learned this from dr johari examine ankle dorsiflexion in inversion so a tight ta can contribute to the altered gait and the springiness of coming inside and a borderline slr positive normally children should norm, normally never have a restricted slr and then if you go back and ask you may get history of some developmental delay so we don't want to miss that okay so i am at 8 19 i'll just show some gates if possible so this is a shall i see this is a classical obese child you can see left side the left side varus with tibial so commonly they'll come at 18 months to 5 years parents are very concerned one of the parent is convinced that there is an issue and everybody else feels that it's a waste to meet the pediatric orthopedic 
but the neighbors have been always tormenting the child it's always painless with normal milestones occasionally gives history of frequent falls this do you agree it would be the classical way they would come and this is how you do the cover test you see the thigh foot axis do an x ray and you reassure the patients that everything is physiological and the child will improve now you look here on the right side you can see the right side inside walking child so we have already discussed in the young walking child it's mainly because of the metatarsus adductus right so this is a neuromuscular challenge child you can see diplegic who has developed significant untoy and now is falling all over the place and this child was then operated is this a video very very early patient of mine you know almost 15 years back this video i must have done and a very early post op and is torsional we had done derotation osteotomies and it got corrected okay so in cerebral palsy children have what is called as the miserable mal alignment whereby there is a antiversion of femur which you correct and the compensatory external rotation of tibia you have to actually neutralize the rotation i hope all agree this is another patient neuromuscular with significant torsional problem and now we have access to gait analysis torsional profile cts which are the investigations of choice and here you know worried about in towing and actually the patient has physiological uh, sorry a uh, developmental genu valgum which will require correction and therefore the in towing will be corrected some out towing cases since we have to talk about so one important point i must mention is that out towing is never physiological okay in towing is physiological and the child can grow out so this is a case with of it bend tightness causing outtowing this is a case of calcaneo valgoid foot causing outtowing so these are uh, patients with hyperlaxity hypotonia mild motor delay you know causing outtowing a grown up child still requiring uh, to uh, climb support to climb stairs is a red flag okay uh, i'll just take one or two more minutes Uh, yes, sir, sure. you examine the child and in prone position you examine for the sacral dimple you look for the torsional profile and above all you will find hyperlaxity in this patient okay hyperextension at the knee and hyperlaxity you can see all the signs of hyperlaxity in patients occasionally you may miss a pathology in the hip so this patient had septic sequelae and therefore is was outtowing okay skiffy patient will be outtowing pffd patients will be outdoing again hyperlaxity hypotonia patients will be outdoing even a more grown up child you know occasionally a subtle case of muscular dystrophy can also present like this is grown up child requiring support so sensory problem and hyperlaxity okay so i'll skip the videos i'll just go to my concluding slide sorry i think you closed all the presentation ah, yeah yeah just a second okay so my concluding uh, slide will state that in towing is a common problem in infants and children the condition causes concern in parents and sometimes produces minor functional problem in children such as frequent tripping the parents concerned must be taken seriously you must evaluate the child carefully and you must try to make an accurate diagnosis giving thorough reassurance you can show videos of your past patients to parents is very important and you must try to treat it by observation only i personally do incorporate uh, training uh, neuro developmental therapy and training if they are willing but braces are useless and osteotomy is a very rare surgery which will be needed in physiological intoing only with very severe deformities i think mainly they'll be unilateral and which do not resolve till the early second decade 11 years of age remember physiological in towing exists but there is nothing called physiological out towing so if you are in out to extortion if you are in more than two standard deviation external rotation it is never physiological and there it requires a very detailed evaluation from hip pathology from motor delay hyperlaxity perspective and from subtle syndromes point of view okay so i think i have finished within time uh, 
thank you so much sir uh, sir there are some questions for you uh, yeah, yeah some particular question from me only sir so when we see a cases of indoing or outdoing in our day to day clinical cases sir so we have to measure the torsional profile for femur so femur we can get by getting a patient in prone and one hand over the gt and we just rotate and pointed out the what will be the inversion uh, what will be the antiversion but when we are talking about the tibia we prone the patient and we do a thigh foot axis the point which you mentioned very correctly if the foot is deformed then you have to measure uh, transmedular axis. Transmedular axis yeah. yes and you go perpendicular so in routine practice, sir, uh, do we always take a goniometer and check that or any there is some particular tricks to get it done that it, this might be going for outgoing or this might be going for intoing? No, actually speaking, what happens is I generally put my hand there, right? On the, the lateral malleolus and the medial malleolus. Yes, sir. Yes. And over the period of years, no, you get this idea in supine and prone, where is it heading? So normally you would always expect the lateral malleolus to be posterior, right? Uh, yes, so if the lateral malleolus is even at the level, uh, means in terms of rotation, right? Mm -hmm. At the level of medial malleolus, then you know that it's in torsion. I would mm -hmm. feel goniometer would be, uh, as usual, we will always use goniometer only in exams or for academic perspective. Okay. Like if you're doing a paper. So that's what, that's what I'm also doing. Mm -hmm. the to put my finger over lateral malleolus and middle malleolus. Yeah, and that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think uh, in terms for the for a purpose for which we are doing here, I really found that concept to be good. You know that you mention uh, measure draw a line perpendicular to the transmalleolar axis and across that you measure the thigh foot axis. Because there are and I also found that point very useful that by definition only in wrong direction and in more than two standard deviation will you call it torsion. <laughs> Within that, you will call it rotation, version, you know, that's the definition. Okay, sir. And one important point, I think, I don't know, maybe all of you all are very learned souls, but I myself realized while preparing this talk is that in towing can be physiological, but yes, sir, that's towing a is never physiological. So I think that's, yes, sir, that's a very, a great very point important you point. Sir. And I feel my own counseling after preparing for this talk to parents has changed, you know, means I really tell them, they dekho, abhi aapka bachcha char saal ka ho gaya hai, to hip ka problem jada hai, hum hip pe focus karenge, you know, that yes. kind of thing. Or achha, abhi ekdam chota hai, so the hip is actually never manifesting. You know, even if you mm -hmm. find significant anti-version of the hip in a 18 month old child, that's not the principal manifester. Okay, the principal manifester is always the foot and the leg. Yes, sir. That, that's Even the point. child is four years of age, will that manifestation happen? You know. So, so, so the this lecture was mostly listened by the fellows, sir. Hmm. So the thing is that if we can say that if in a prone position we palpate malleolus and middle malleolus, lateral malleolus and middle malleolus, and if lateral malleolus is going posterior, that means it's in a um, it's a, a physiological. If they are, they are both at the same level that it is going in torsion and if middle malleolus is up and lateral malleolus is down, then it's going in external rotation. For uh, So this will be a correct statement? Yes, yes, yes. External rotation, normally you will have about 15 degrees. Only about 15 degrees of extorsion is permitted. Okay. So more than 10 to 15 degrees of tibial extorsion would become extortion, external okay. rotation. So that you will see in cerebral palsy patients, whereby you call it the miserable malalignment. Okay. So, so there is too much of antiversion of the femur and too much of external rotation of the tibia. Mm -hmm. So that so will be de So when I derotate the femur, let's say by 40 degrees or by mm -hmm. 30 degrees, I will have to do a similar distal tibial internal rotation osteotomy so that mm -hmm. I don't worsen the miserable malalignment. Okay, sure. Thank you. So However, much. I must say that those kind of surgeries have decreased in my practice. Okay, so, sir. I don't know. It was done dime a dozen when I was with Dr. Johari. Uh, when you have all kinds of uh, grown up walking diplegics coming in the late, late second decade, you know, you have to have that kind of practice, you know, uh, whereby you are attached to some institution or somebody who's constantly feeding you with patients who are coming in the late second decade. 15, 16, 17, walking diplegics with these kind of torsional problems. Okay, sure. Thank you so much, sir. So, there's one more question is how to manage hyperlaxity related to outdoing gait? 
well so i think it's continuous uh, i have uh, now what we have developed is our own pediatric therapy department okay so we have couple of pediatric therapists who are working uh, three alternate days in a week at my place so we put them on therapy and i tell them that training is the only way and a lot of time they have sensory issues so once you overcome their sensory issues then they can grow out of their outgoing sensory means balance issues right uh, and uh, that's just about it uh, i think outgoing can sometimes be managed with if the parents are happy then we can manage with a smo or an afo for a while okay sure so that's all the question we have then we head towards the second lecture by dr vidya sagar sir are you here uh, yes yes i'm very much there Can yes. can you see me? Can uh, no, sir. We are not able to see your presentation. Now? Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Now we we can see you. Uh, good morning, good everyone. Morning, I would like to agree with Dr. Tushar when he said that uh, Dr. Mowlin has chosen us appropriately, mild uh, <laughs> orthopedic surgeons, and uh, I would also thank him for setting the tone for you know, physiological things in children. and my next talk would be uh, similar in his lines i'll share my desktop now i just let me know chinmay if you are able sir. to see the yes sir, we are able to see your presentations yes yeah so yes, why are we talking about flat foot because there is no true definition of a flat foot what we believe is when there is a weight bearing foot with a abnormally low or absent medial longitudinal arch we call it as a, a flat foot so we compare with the others and then we say that it's a flat foot but what we need to really ask ourselves is is the function normal is it going to progress and if you see a flat foot what is the type of flat foot you are looking into and really does it need intervention and if so when and how aggressively and lastly when it comes to a surgical decision making what are the techniques or things which you are going to use or decide what you are going to do so that comes from a latin word that is a platypus flat footed and staheli has mentioned that uh, this is usually in infant common in children and within normal range in adults and arch development is a phenomena which happens in the first decade of life so there is lot of time where we patiently watch and just observe the patient and then flexible flat foot with the tight heel cord will worsen and when you have a rigid flat foot then the treatment usually becomes unavoidable so what do we see in physical examination we do a gait examination and see how the child is walking and we look at the torsion profile nicely mentioned by dr tushar because in this uh, profile changes also you can get a compensatory foot deformity sometimes especially in cerebral palsy and then when you have a angular deformity like in children with a physiological genu varum they may present with a flat foot and then most of the girls and especially uh, children who are less than 2 they may have the excessive laxity because of which the arch may be uh, looking as if it is collapsed and then you must do a quick and good neurological examination to rule out the other uh, neuromuscular disorder so when you come to foot examination you look at the foot per se in three parts the hind foot mid foot and fore foot so what's happening at fore foot what's happening in the mid foot and what's happening to the heel so that can be done by examining the patient from the front from the sides and from the back and sometimes from the plantar surface so we look at the medial and lateral border we look at the bony prominence any tenderness medial side or lateral side then at the subtalar joint mobility look for the heel cord that is the tendoclis shortening and occasionally we may find a, a perineal uh, spasm in case of <clears throat> pathological flat foot also uh, we see that there are other factors which could be contributing to it like obesity ligamentous laxity early shoe wearing then torsional deformities tibialis posterior insufficiency which is common in adolescents not in younger kids and then sometimes you get a tight tendoclis and the children may present after 8 uh, to about 12 13 for tarsal collation occasionally you may see also hypotonia which is sometimes related to the neuromuscular disorders so what are we going to see on the physical examination sagging of the medial arch 
and if you look at the foot it may appear that hind foot is in valgus and then the talus appears plantar flexed and medially tilted sometimes you can palpate it at right at the center of the arch on the medial side and uh, you can see midfoot and forefoot abduction generally what we what we call as a forefoot uh, pronation which is actually a supination in relation to the hind foot uh, uh, hind foot yes and then you get a tight heel cord and forefoot pronation so what we are basically looking is whether we are dealing with a physiological flat foot or a non physiological the uh, the transition sometimes blurs but mostly if you see a physiological flat foot in non wet bearing position you should see a good arch and when you do uh, dorsiflex the first toe that is the jack test you find the arch improves to a great extent and when the child goes into wet bearing you see that there is a arch collapse and when you make the child stand on the toes that is on tip toe you see the uh, beautifully from behind that both the heels are going into varus so that's the normal movement uh, of the uh, foot toe overall so when it so this is the position i wanted to show from back it looks as if it is valgus and then when you ask them to stand on the toes then they invert the hind foot beautifully inverts and that indicates that it's a flexible uh, nature of the uh, flat foot and you might find too many uh, toes sign that is when you look from behind too many toes you see on the outer side and uh, then the forefoot appears to be pronated but it is in fact supinated in relation to the hind foot so the heel cord if you see the tendo achilles instead of put, pulling in a vertical direction it pulls uh, in a outward direction in flat foot and like in club foot it put, pulls in the inward direction so that can lead to further worsening sometimes and uh, this mechanism depends on the flexibility at the subtalar joint as well as the windlass effect which you get because of the uh, plantar fascia and other structures attached to the calcaneal tuberosity so this is a patient uh, i'm asking the child to do that and uh, you can see the heel inverts so that's a uh, flat foot which is quite flexible and how do you check is uh, you cup the heel uh, uh, in in your left hand and then you bring the ankle to neutral position so that the talus get locked and that in position in that position you have to check the uh, subtalar joint movement that is inversion and eversion and in the same position also with the heel neutral you can check for tendo achilles tightness that is you dorsiflex the ankle in knee extension first and then in knee flexion to see whether the tendo achilles is tight or not so if the dorsiflexion improves uh, <clears throat> normally the 10 degrees of dorsiflexion is expected and uh, Uh, in knee extension and when it further improves it's a good sign that means it is not tight but when you feel that even in flexion extension nothing is changing probably the whole tendo achilles is tight and uh, if it is changing in flexion and extension of knee then only the gastrocnemius is, is tight so that's the position look for knee laxity uh, like hyper extension look for that uh, thumb whether the child can touch the thumb to the forearm and then a hyper extension at this thing so actually you are scoring the beaten score that is to look for hyperlaxity syndrome which can also have flat foot so uh, so this is i am checking the dorsiflexion now in knee extension and uh, it doesn't change much actually just coming to neutral even in knee flexion so the whole tendo achilles is tight here if the dorsiflexion improves a lot then it means you need uh, you there is only the gastrocnemius component which is involved the soleus is good so normally we don't take x rays for all the patients so only if the foot becomes painful i think uh, x rays are indicated or in case of rigid flat foot so what are the x rays uh, we would be taking if we see such a case is ideally a non weight bearing first we'll talk about the weight bearing x rays that is uh, anterior posterior or the dorsal plantar view of the foot and then the ankle with foot lateral in stressed or weight bearing position and in special cases where we are suspecting a tarsal collation we may take a non weight bearing position uh, like uh, oblique uh, view of the foot and uh, harris uh, or axial view so that's how they take uh, those views to know the relationship of the tibia to the calcaneum and sometimes 
to know what is happening at the subtalar joint also you take the harris view and oblique view is generally taken when we are looking into uh, uh, like calcaneo navicular foliations so basically in lateral view we are looking for the talus first metatarsal angle and if there is a reduced arch where the uh, intersection of those two lines are which uh, represents the that apex represents the uh, core of the deformity and the calcaneal pitch uh, which is uh, shown here uh, in the figure on the left hand side lower corner so sometimes you also see for this anterior sign that is where the anterior process of calcaneum is engaging too much towards the navicular and a c sign where there is a tallow calcaneal collation and you see this complete arch here you get a reverse anterior sign term sometimes in non uh, that is non physiological or pathological club, uh, flat foot so you should look for it and these things in ap view you look for the talar uncovering and also you look for the uh, first metatarsal and talus angle which represents the four foot abduction you can also measure the talo navicular angle here articular surfaces are marked and then you can measure that and you can measure the talo uh, calcaneal uh, angle also so remember in flat foot it's going to be uh, more the higher and in club foot it is reverse they are almost parallel so you might not need investigation in all the cases but when you suspect tarsal collation you might need ct to look for degenerative changes as well as the collation exact extent rarely you need a mri uh, especially in the flexible flat foot sometimes they have this uh, tibialis posterior tendinopathy in adolescent so then time you may need uh, mri and sometimes to see the fibrocartilaginous uh, uh, syndesmosis so in mobility wise if the flat foot is flexible and it is asymptomatic then generally it doesn't require any treatment but a flat foot uh, with a tight tendocles or symptomatic flat foot i think uh, parents come again and again for you to uh, know what can be done remember the symptoms are always secondary to uh, ankle uh, dorsiflexion which is bypassed because of the tight ta because of the stress which is supported or given to the uh, adjacent joints show part joints and sometimes very rarely accessory navicular may actually stretch the tip post and cause the symptoms and again uh, in a more severe deformity you get impingement at the sinus tarsi so these can lead to a painful flat foot and the goal then would be to relieve the pain preserve mobility improve the function prevent the progression if possible and reduce the deformity so the way i say that it's a physiological flat foot is the flexibility of the flat foot and asymptomatic nature and there is no tendo achilles tightness so if these three things are there and there is no progression with time then i would just watch and observe them and i would not like to treat them in any way and uh, they are considered sometimes even the parents and grandparents have a similar flat foot so they don't generally require treatment so when you see a foot like this that is right side the patient was getting uh, pain and but the hind foot was quite flexible the ankle dorsiflexion was limited to some extent and there was medial pain so i put him on calf stretches and then uh, uh, some medial arch support and actually i like that uh, when there is a too much of hind foot deformity i like to use uh, uh, what we call as a ucbl device and if still you think it is persistent then you may need to do a tendo achilles or a gastrocnemius resection here so these are the conservative methods where we use and generally they are used only for symptomatic patients so that you can align realign the arch in a better position but beware and inform the parents that this device is not for correction of the flat foot rather it is to support the foot in high demand activities like walking and running so that the foot doesn't become painful so these are always used in a symptomatic child never used in a asymptomatic when you have too much hind foot valgus then this ucbl brace helps because it also works on the hind foot as well as the mid foot and tries to maintain the arch and uh, corrects the deformity so you need good aggressive tendocles stretching in these cases so that's the correction what we get and you can easily put them in the shoe supports 
very rarely when the child is symptomatic with a flexible flat foot you have soft tissue procedures which are done but never in isolation except the probably strayers release these are never done in isolation and there is a option for arthrosis in adolescent age group where the subtalar joint is not arthrosis but the movement is locked using a metallic graft or a bone graft and there are bony reconstruction which are mentioned and last option is arthrodesis which we rarely do so just for discussion sake i have kept so soft tissue procedures which we generally do is gastroprocession sometimes tendo achilles lengthening if it is tight and then if you get a tip post insufficiency then you can transfer the fdl to the tip post insertion from the navicular area from plantar to the dorsal so arthrodesis is one option in a adolescent age group when the child is in fact having a severe collapse and a recurrent talon navicular dissociation and they may require this device which is put through the sinus tarsi uh, in collaboration with the tendoclis recession or gastrocnemius uh, sorry tendoclis lengthening or gastrocnemius recession so this is another procedure which was described to correct the severe hind foot valgus through a medial displacement osteotomy of the calcaneus and it realized the hind foot valgus it is something similar to the chiari i believe what we do in ddh and uh, these are again rarely required in severe uh, flat foot with uh, deformed uh, hind foot so that's the fixation and another commonly done procedure especially in cerebral palsy and even a milder flat foot so is this lateral calcaneal neck osteotomy which was first described by ivan and then it was modified by mosca and then later hinterman so what we basically do is uh, proximal to the cc joint we do this uh, osteotomy between the anterior and middle facet and it is a kind of oblique osteotomy and it's a distraction lengthening osteotomy which uh, what dr mosca describes you know the calcaneo pedal block which we depend on whether we are doing ctv or flat foot so it realizes the hind foot also and the forefoot uh, abduction also so it's a distraction opening wedge osteotomy it improves the talonavicular sag and uh, then improves midfoot abduction improves the hind foot valgus but when you get a talonavicular dissociation or the angle more than 25 or 30 probably this in isolation will not work so the way we do it is they have described this incision but i generally use a transverse incision nowadays to protect the sural nerve and we can do the perineal this thing also at the same time and uh, i use the k wires but this case i have used the recon plate because i wanted to mobilize the patient very early and uh, that's the graft in the open wedge and this is a case of same flat foot symptomatic flat foot severe pain on the lateral side due to impingement so what we had done was we had done a tendo achilles lengthening and a moscas on the lateral side and uh, medial side uh, we had done a reefing of the capsule there and sometimes when we correct the deformity you know the forefoot may supinate that is the unmasking of the forefoot supination may happen in that case you may need a something like a cotton osteotomy to bring the first metatarsal or toe down so this is the example of the same foot which was managed and you can see the beautiful restoration of the talon navicular sag as well as the calcaneum pitch and this is a child after 2 months and you can compare the left and right we had done a strayers with that mosca and this is after 5 years and totally asymptomatic so this is a 13 year old boy symptomatic uh, flat foot you can see the severe valgus is almost loading on the medial border of the foot and uh, you can see that hind foot is valgus the fore foot is abducted and there is a tiny tendo achilles here so this is the examination of the same child where we check the subtalar joint mobility on both the sides so actually this has to be done in ankle uh, slightly down and then you also check for the gastrocnemius uh, or the tendo achilles tightness so this child has this talonavicular uncoverage and symptomatic flat foot after using the braces six months he is still progressive and painful and uh, that's his weight bearing x ray ap and lateral we can see the talonavicular angle is quite high and um, 
you can see the tallow uh, calcaneal angle is very high here and the, uh, the Mieris angle, that is the first metatarsal and the talus angle is totally way off the normal four or five degrees. So that's the talonavicular angle, that's the tallow calcaneal angle and that's the talus first metatarsal angle. And that's the calcaneal pitch, the tallow calcaneal angle and the first metatarsal, that's the Mieris angle. So all are way off. So what I did was a tendoculus uh, lengthening there and on a medial side, lateral side did a uh, same MOSCA procedure. And on the medial side, I also did a, because once I did the MOSCA procedure, the first metatarsal was not touching the, uh, in weight bearing, it was not touching the uh, foot when we simulated it. So I did a closing uh, cuneiform osteotomy on the plantar side. And then we got good correction. So that's the pre-op and the post-op. So these surgeries are done very, very rarely. And... Uh, I don't think uh, I have corrected much flat foots in so many years, but when properly indicated, yes, uh, they have their own benefits and it should be offered when the child is not responding to your uh, orthotic measures, especially in adolescent age groups. So you get sometimes the post insufficiency and then when you do a single heel rise test, you can easily test and then you can note for tenderness along the tip post, uh, which indicates that there is tendinitis and some inflammation there. So that again, this is another case where there was a tip post insufficiency, the tendon was degenerated and uh, this patient was about 19 or 20, I think when we managed. So we did a calcaneal slide osteotomy and I also transferred the FDL to the navicular. You can see the drill hole in the navicular. So that's the um, uh, procedure to uh, just reinforce the tip post, which is not functioning. And uh, you can go through this. Uh, this is all very theoretical thing. So some message would be, it's very, very common in children, does not require treatment all the time, but we don't know where there is blurring of uh, uh, this thing between a physiological and non-physiological club foot. So watch out for the red flags, especially the tight heel cord, a progression of deformity and appearance of pain, which means that uh, something wrong is going and you need to mechanically realign it. And in that case, you start with bracing with good stretches, with good physiotherapy. And then most of the symptoms will get just relieved with this. If not, then surgery should be chosen as a last resort and it should be a la carte. That is, it should be addressing what problem is noted. And uh, I, I would like to end my talk here and if any questions are there, I will take. Thank you. Yes, can, we, can, I, can I make a questions. comment? Sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah, yeah. So superb talk, yeah, uh, boss. Uh, Mira, I almost uh, want to request you to lend me some of those slides. Uh, so uh, one, one or two comments. You know, I have found that I get these very early kids, very small kids, um, um, about three years, two and a half years, or even younger, who come with unilateral flat foot, uh, and I have found that they have mild hemihypertrophy means mild asymmetry in limb length and it's a compensatory flat foot. So I think uh, unilateral flat foot is a definite red flag yes. for people to really look at it more carefully. And a unilateral flat foot can also, you have to flip the child behind and look for a low sacral dimple and it could be an indication of a spina bifida occulta also. And I find that... Uh, now, definitely not in the group of pediatric orthopedists, but take uh, regular orthopedic surgeons you know, would never get weight bearing films, you know. So it's very important that the child, whenever we are getting x-rays, they have to be ipsilateral uh, or single stance weight bearing films. And all x-ray clinics don't have the expertise to get that uh, classical weight bearing film. So in order to calculate um, that you know everything is okay whether I need to treat I think we need to get that weight bearing film and one question I want to ask you is if you are using braces do you take x-rays before and after just to see whether the brace is exactly where you want to and are we able to correct yes. the lines or is it yes, just yes. a clinical correction no no I do take x-rays because I have uh, uh, trained our uh, orthotic guys also so hmm. that they do that uh, uh, before and after. Uh, so once in the brace, how is the correction happening? 
and in fact i encouraged him to do once this study it's ongoing uh, on uh, using that ucbl what is the difference you see mm. radiologically with brace and without brace and probably in uh, some time uh, it will come so sandeep patwardhan had put up a question once uh, in one of the viroc meetings as an mcq up to what age uh, will you not call a foot a flat foot so is it 2 years 4 years 6 years 8 years something like that and the correct answer was 6 years so up to the age of 6 uh, you would not want to call any foot flat so yeah. i think there is some corroboration to that on uh, literature also that any child who is less than 6 years you would not even want to put that on paper that the child has flat foot correct if, if there is no other pathology right in the so Sorry. this uh, i was also like you were reading i did some research and there was some interesting comments especially from i think uh, I, i don't remember the name but what they say is the human evolution happened from a quadriped to a bipod so before the foot was mentioned uh, or even used for grasp function so as the humans evolved to bipeds the grasp function totally got lost somewhere in the evolution so those authors have mentioned this a plano valgus foot as a scar on human a scar on the human uh, foot development so that means uh, there is something residual but again dr benjamin joseph has nicely shown in many articles that actually what we are treating or even saying as a flat foot could be a normal variant of foot so i tell my parents because they don't understand so then i tell them okay the africans are there and there are our chinese uh, counterparts so chinese always have this straight curly silky hair and the uh, africans have slightly curly hair so we can't say that this is right or this is wrong so sometimes flat foot can also be a normal variant our children's parents and grandparents have and they have never had any problem in their whole life so i think we should also stop thinking that it is a abnormal foot all the time yeah and uh, i i have also counseled pa- parents saying that if you ever feel that this child is not going to be participating in sports actively if you feel that is happening it's not because the foot is flat but because yes. he is hyperlax and hypotonic yes. that is more important it is not the positioning of the foot his overall body is hyperlax and hypotonic and he requires a higher level of training Yes. you know and i tell that you know some people are better in literature in humanities and some people are better in maths so it is if you want to score more you got to take tuitions so if you are weak in a particular subject you take more tuitions so if you really want your child to participate in more in sports right then you will have to take more training if he is hyperlax and hypotonic correct so i will just mention two points here one is uh, dr benjamin joseph sir's paper which says that if you are going to use a shoe or early shoe where can actually delay the arch development so uh, uh, people like uh, yes, yes, professor yes, wenger yes. and benjamin joseph don't believe and they say that barefoot walking is the best and the second thing uh, because fellows and pgs are here so why the flat foot becomes a good arch by 10 uh, why we say that uh, arch develops or it's the phenomena of the first decade is there are some reasons i would like to highlight one is as the child grows you know the child comes out of that uh, tibial inter- tibial uh, vera which can present as flat foot and comes into a normal physiological alignment and the second reason is what we have a flat, fat foot actually fat fat foot mm-hmm. in children so the slowly the fat also disappears with time and the third would be uh, the neuromuscular control improves as the child walks and as he grows so that's the reason the dynamic stabilizers of the foot are more efficient or functional in the older age group and the last category was the bones started start to really ossify which are soft and cartilages and yielding they start to ossify so the, you may get a more biomechanical uh, stability in the older kids and the last would be the laxity which gradually improves with time and age so now this sudden craze which has hit all of us you know of arthroarthritis with the new implant and yes. you know it is uh, getting cashless approval so it is becoming very convenient to do you know and they call it uh, acute talotarsal dislocation 
for insurance so, sake yes <laughs> ha, for insurance sake so how are how much are you excited with it matlab no, no. i am very excited though i am going to be next week arguing against it yes we said that i'm arguing against it but uh, you know i'm very excited with it uh, i've done it in two patients and uh, both the patients are actually extremely happy but in the short run so i don't know what is going to happen 60 years down the line or 40 years down the line yeah so, is it a right thing to really block a joint you know correct yeah. so that's a good way to look at it it's a idea basically so lot of people our own people used to do that uh, bony graft insertion before hmm. and uh, now what we are doing is simply putting another device in the joint uh, eotts uh, yes eotts and yeah. uh, it's there in the market and people are doing it but i do it very 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 rarely in selected uh, selected means i have done like you two till now hmm. and that too with our foot and ankle surgeon uh, flexible very much hyperpronating foot and with a tight gastrocnemius otherwise uh, symptomatic patient not responding to this i have done uh, in two cases but i don't know because parents always ask the question because i don't offer them that i'll do arthroresis i tell them these are the two options you have or let's say three options and i allow them to be a part of the decision making i tell them what happens with this and what happens with this whether this is a natural way which is arthroresis i don't believe it's a natural way it just mechanically realigns i would i'm more inclined towards the uh, other uh, osteotomy and other stuff so i always tell them last week uh, i had a patient who had shown to joyri sir and then came to me so they were offered both the ct eotts and this thing then i counsel them then I, the mother told the doctor what is the natural way in long term do you think this will stay so then in a way i gave them that okay natural way would be a bony osteotomy and this thing and you don't need any foreign body placement there in your ankle there is no risk of dislodgement and all but it works fine especially when you are looking at a transition phase no from adolescent to the mm-hmm. adult it it has some value i believe i don't know properly where it fits into right now but it has some benefit i say so i <clears throat> i attended two of their meetings and uh, they make such tall claims that you know people start running marathons after eotts surgeries i think that would eventually wear off somewhere i don't know because even uh, in talk here they showed that uh, the patient they don't recommend doing but they are doing soccer and all other stuff but we have to look into really long term what is happening so and now they are extrapolating it to all other indications like cerebral palsy neuromuscular spina bifida you know just do a eotts so <clears throat> we'll come to know four five years down the line i think that would be a separate meeting yes in dp i'm happy with mosca and ta lengthening uh, sorry gastrocnemius recession i don't think i have required more than that but i know few people are using that uh, have you used it uh-huh. in cerebral palsy no 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 but i would be honestly you know uh, not in a group of uh, fellows but i would feel interested to do it because uh, the see I, i am positioned in a pediatric orthopedic practice uh, which is at at this more of this kind of work you know so probably it may come into the armamentorium but like you said you have to leave it to the parents you can't you know it's not like a ddx surgery where you have to really sell the surgery and you tell them that this hip has to come in means you are committing yes. a grave blunder by not getting operated so you can't tell the parents uh, of a flat foot patient that you are committing a grave blunder you know by not getting operated yes and one more thing is peroneal spastic flat foot you know coming at the age of 9 10 uh them i am finding it a very difficult proposition to suddenly treat you know what to do and uh, especially those who are peroneal spastic flat foot without any coalition means on mri you are not getting any coalition yeah, that, so i feel something is a, i had a child last week and i suspected there is a talo sorry calcaneo navicular coalition because they were too close enough and the joint was kind of uh, irregular Uh, but you know uh, actually i try conservative and sometimes i have even given botox okay uh, to the peroneal and try to see how the patient responds whether the pain goes off and uh, sometimes it can help in decision making also what what you are going so to so that's do. a very interesting thing so you can do botox to the peroneal 
Yeah. And th therefore, you can find out whether it's pure muscular or it's coming from a irritation in the subtalar joint itself. Yes. And our, uh, occasionally, I have used a local anesthetic injection also under CM into the joint if we are suspecting. And because MRI, they don't look really for that uh, calcino navicular collation, especially. They report it as normal foot and all most of the time. Mm -hmm. So specifically, I talk to them and see whether it is there because the cross sections are entirely different where you find that uh, the, it needs an oblique cut. It doesn't need a really uh, axial or coronal or sagittal for looking into this talo, uh, sorry, calcaneo navicular coalition. So sometimes local anesthesia can help you to get to the source of pain. Superb. So any other questions, boss? I'm sorry we cross-talked, Chinmay, but I thought it will be a good discussion to bring about. So there is a question there, I think. Uh, arthrosis in uh, CP kids with uh, plano valgus foot. Uh, uh, so you, we have, uh, sort of, you have probably already answered. Now, Dr. Johari in the last meeting said that he has started using it and he is probably now very keen to do it. <clears throat> but I don't think so because I think they are very osteopenic bones. Far more osteoporotic than regular kids. Yes. And uh, so for such a long time, we have the Moscas procedure, which is quite well established in uh, cerebral palsy. It's, so I think it's your call whether you want to use a EOTTS or you want to use the traditional flat feet surgeries. Yeah, but one word of caution is you can err with Mosca, but this has to be very, very selective and choosy, the procedure of EOTTS. You have to select them very, very carefully. Otherwise, even with Mosca, I would tell uh, fellows to be careful because it looks like an easy surgery. And sometimes in a very high demand cerebral palsy, diaplegic patient who is cognitively very alert and who's going to really walk a lot, you know, uh, they can become disillusioned uh, with some pain which can creep in later somewhere else. So I have had one or two patients. Uh, in cerebral palsy, I have become very cautious operating in the second decade, you know, at 14, 15, 16, especially if the child is very cognitively good, you know, brilliant, coming in 10th, 11th, 12th, you know, appearing for competitive exams. But most of the time, the child has hereditary spastic paraparesis and does not have traditional cerebral palsy because the cerebral palsy child will have some cognitive challenges and some fine motor challenges. So if you don't have any fine motor challenges in the upper limb and you are not cognitively challenged, then you must look very carefully for hereditary spastic paraparesis because you tend to operate and in a year or two, this patient can become a big challenge in your practice. And you know, it's a progressive disease and they are unhappy with your surgery. Yes. Anything else, boss Chinmay? No, sir. Yes, that's all we are having today, sir. Yeah, Chinmay, so you may want to conclude then if our Molin is not there. then So uh, today we have a nice uh, talk over the, the physiological variants that is more important when we see in our day-to-day -day clinics. Some of the points made by Tushar sir about the, uh, uh, the age-wise distribution of the torsion from infancy to the, up to the age of two and after the three, what we are looking for, that is a very good point. And at the same time, uh, the foot measurement the transmedular axis point is very good, so we can use it in clinical day-to-day -day practice. Talking about the flexible flat foot, the cells demonstration about the high heel toe test uh, for visualizing the heel in varus and valgus will give an insight about any restrictions in subtalar joint. I always examine the subtalar joint before intervene. The flexible flat foot will eventually go well, and some of, sometimes we we can use orthosis. And the point very well made that the before and after X-ray after the orthosis will give the exact uh, insight in uh, insight about how this uh, orthosis will work. So these are the all the points which are very well for us uh, for every fellow who are currently pursuing his uh, career in pediatric orthopedy. Thank you so much, sir. Thank I, you. I feel I feel you should hesitate to operate any flat foot which is painless. Okay, sir. Uh, that I definitely feel. No matter how cosmetically challenged, if the patient has outtoing difficulty, but you know, if the patient does not have pain, any pain at all, you ask repeatedly, you know, like, nahi, nahi hai, dard nahi hai, kuch bhi karne mein dard nahi. then I feel, I feel very hesitant to operate patients who are pain-free. 
you know surgeries uh, which can be disputed and when you do it for a pain free patient and the patient becomes painful it's a very big challenge it's a very good point yeah. thank you so much sir. thank right. you so much yeah great yeah great have being with you guys thanks thanks a lot thank you thank you Hello, sir. Can we end the meeting?